edition of Surgeons Lives. I'm your host, John Monson. My guest today is Dr. Rick Green. Rick is a man who has two lives, really. The first uh, is one best known for his contributions to the world of uh, cancer and cancer surgery. Um, as a surgeon for his career, he um, perhaps made his best known contributions when he became a chairman of the Commission on Cancer uh, for a number of years. He's retained his interest in cancer data, cancer analytics, and all of that work, and continues to contribute um, in his current role um, as the head of uh, cancer data and informatics for Cancer Center. On another side of his life is his um, world of communications. I think it's correct to say that he's been um, a radio personality of sorts since his teenage years, um, but in recent decades has um, become a, a pioneer in the world of uh, podcasts. Maybe we should chat to him about how to do that properly um, in our conversation today. He uh, runs the Society of Surgical Oncology podcast, as well as an American College of Surgeons podcast. So there's no doubt um, he's going to have a lot to talk to us about today, as well as a lot to teach uh, me in terms of how to um, uh, develop and deliver a, a, a good podcast experience for people. So without further ado, um, let's join the conversation uh, with Dr. Rick Green. This is Surgeon's Lives. John Monson. Well, there we go. How are you, my good man? I'm good. And, it's, and it's, you, you can it, it's nice hear me to okay? See you. I can hear you beautifully. Good. Um, well, thank you, sir, for uh, uh, joining me on... Uh, I feel... I feel um, humbled, of course, by uh, sitting here pretending to have a podcast with the master of podcasts, etc. Um, I am not worthy. You're going to bring tears to my eyes. <laughs> I think you'll manage to control your emotions. <laughs> so, John, how are you? I'm good, thank you very much. Um, good, nice good. Surviving uh, the Florida uh, uh, weather, you know, which is right. Just it's about the only time of the year where it's pleasant, you know? Um, yeah, yeah. You've been there quite a number of years now. Um, yes, uh, seven. Yeah, um, yeah. So, and um, what about yourself? You're keeping well? Yeah, I uh, keeping well and busy. I just got, I flew in this morning from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I gave two cancer talks yesterday to their uh, Louisiana Cancer Registrars Association meeting. And, uh, you know, I'm medical director at my cancer center, and I'm now chief medical officer for a software company that makes cancer registry software. So that's keeping me busy, plus all of these other things I'm doing. And you're um, uh, at this stage um, uh, beyond, shall we say, a tad beyond the um, statutory retirement age of the National Health Service in the UK. So you're definitely keeping yourself busy. Well, I got out of the operating room about nine years ago, but, uh, you know, I, I enjoy life and I'm um, spending a little more time now with uh, family and grandchildren, things like that. Yeah. Well, um, as, as I mentioned uh, in my invitation, um, uh, you know, the podcast is called Surgeon's Lives um, because um, as much as anything else, um, I've been talking to surgeons of all um, shapes and sizes in careers and locations internationally, US, UK, Australia. Um, a little bit about their career, of course, because that's a, a scene setter, but as much, if not more, about um, the rest of their life and, and what makes up the person and, and the, bits, um, the bits outside of the operating room and, and, and the office. And so um, what I... What I've done is ask people, and I'll ask you um, to, if you could set the scene for us um, with a brief uh, summary of life and time, starting with the words, I was born in. Well, I was born 
That was that's when, but is born in, I should say. I was born. I was born in where you mean? Where yeah, I was yeah, born? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I started my life. I was born in Norfolk, Virginia, um, and I was the uh, first child of two. Uh, two parents who were both in the military. And uh, my father was in the army. My mother was actually one of the first Coast Guard uh, women in World War II. And a little piece of trivia for you, what they call Coast Guard women is spars. Uh, that's the name for Coast Guard women. So I grew up in Virginia. Uh, my father was in the jewelry business. My mother was a teacher. So the only person that I had any contact with uh, who was in medicine was an uncle in New Jersey. And I would love going up to his home because he was a general practitioner who actually had his office in his house. Yeah. And I would sit in his living room, which was, it was adorned with these, this beautiful dark wood. And all of a sudden there was a secret door that opened up into his clinic and he would allow me to go in there. And I, that's where I got used to see, you know, the smells of medicine and I wanted to be a doctor. And um, how, how did you go about that? Um, uh, what was your process? Well, again, I, I grew up in a very small town in Virginia. It was called Colonial Heights, Virginia. It was about 80 people in my graduating high school class. I knew from around the age of five that I wanted to be a doctor. Oh, wow. I actually remember telling people, I want to find a cure for cancer. That's what I found. Now, as, as things turned out, uh, as I got older and got into, went to the University of Virginia for college and med school, uh, I wanted to be a heart surgeon. And so uh, when I applied for my surgical residency, uh, I went to Yale uh, to be a heart surgeon. But at that time, there was something called the Berry Plan. It was the uh, Vietnam was going on. It was the end of Vietnam in the early 70s. And uh, you could pick your, your area of interest, your service. I picked the Navy, maybe because I was born in Norfolk, Virginia. Who knows? But uh, I picked the Navy, and they were going to uh, allow me to have two years of training, PGY1 in two years, and then I would have to go in active duty. But as things turned out, during my second year, I had already given up my position. And as you know quite well, there used to be a pyramid program uh, where 16 of us started and only four would finish uh, in the Yale program. And so once I gave it up, it was gone. And uh, so when the Navy then came to me and said, oh, well, we made a mistake. Uh, you can stay for five or six or seven years of training, whatever you like. So I went to my chair and I said, you know, what am I going to do? I don't have a position. He said, well, we can give you an American Cancer Society fellowship for a year. Oh, well, you know, uh, that's not going to help me very much. I want to be a heart surgeon. He said, well, take it or leave it. So I took it and uh, he sent me to London uh, where I got to uh, stay for about six months uh, at the National Colon and Rectal Hospital called St. Mark's Hospital on City Road, mm -hmm. and uh, you know it well. And uh, yeah. my wife was delighted because her family was from London. Huh. And uh, we got to uh, meet a lot of her family. And so that started my interest. I learned how to do colonoscopy from the wonderful GI people at St. Mark's. So when I came back to Yale, and as a, as a fellow in the lab, in 1972, 73, I was the only one at Yale who knew how to do colonoscopy. So they would call on me to colonoscope patients. I was a, uh, a pisher, as we say. Uh, I was a PGY3, but I knew how to do colonoscopy. And so, you know, that started my interest in cancer. Uh, at at St. Mark's, uh, I was able to meet Cuthbert Dukes uh, of the Dukes classification. Yeah became interested in staging of cancer. And I worked with Basil Morrison, Sir Basil Morrison, noted GI pathologist. Yeah. Uh, I got to help him write his, uh, his book on GI pathology. So it opened up a lot of doors for me. Yeah, very much so, very much so. And 
and set you serendipitously serendipitously on a path um, that you've followed ever since to a great extent. Absolutely. I, I gave up the idea of being a cardiac surgeon and uh, I was happy with that. So uh, I finished my training uh, at Yale. I went into the Navy. I was on a nuclear aircraft carrier for a year and it was a wonderful experience. Uh, as a matter of fact, I could have changed my whole course because there was a movie that was made on the USS Nimitz, which was my ship. And uh, the movie was called The Final Countdown. Currently, it's on Netflix if you want to look at it, but I was going to have the speaking part in that movie of The Ship's Doctor. The movie starred Kirk Douglas, Martin Sheen, James Farentino, and some other notables. But as luck would have it, uh, they started shooting the movie uh, after I left the ship and I went to a naval hospital and they wouldn't let me come back to the ship to help film the movie. So as they say, uh, I could have been a contender. Yeah. Uh, it would have changed my entire career. Hollywood's loss was surgery's gain. Absolutely. So, um, but if you have a chance, yeah. uh, look at the final countdown. I think you'd enjoy it. Yeah, and we'll be able to watch it and say, you know, Rick would have been far better in that job. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think I would have done a much better job than the guy that they got to play the ship's doctor. I agree with that. <laughs> of course. Now, you, uh, uh, I mean, obviously you you um, brushed shoulders with the giants such as Cuthbert Jukes and Basil, Basil and Morrison and <clears throat> the, um, you know, the surgeons of the time, you know, Peter Hawley and people like that, etc. cetera. Uh, where, where have mentors um, played a, a role in your life? And, and uh, you know, most people have mentors. Were your mentors, did you choose them intentionally or was it, again, serendipity? I go serendipity. Uh, again, while I was a first-year resident, I came into contact with a wonderful man who nobody's really heard of or remembered. His name was Ira Goldenberg. He was at Yale, and he had the crazy notion, this was 1970, that instead of doing a radical mastectomy for breast cancer, you could just take out the cancer and leave the rest of the breast. And um, he worked with a, a fellow named Lenny Prosnitz at Yale, who then said, well, you know, if you're going to just take out the lump, maybe we should radiate the breast after you take out the lump. And everybody really made fun of, of Ira. He was, uh, he was uh, a point of derision by many because of this concept. And unfortunately, uh, he died of an MI uh, at a fairly early age and never saw what happened with lumpectomy for breast cancer. So he, he was really my first mentor. He, he also taught me how to talk to patients, how to communicate with people, especially uh, in the last stages of an illness. And this uh, really stuck with me. I had I had many uh, good surgeons who I learned from, especially biliary surgeons uh, during my training and 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 after. But I think uh, Ira really really sticks with me as somebody who is uh, so important to me. What do you, what has been your? How would you define a good surgeon? Uh, you know, having having a few years on the clock, you've had a number of years to think about that question you know from at the beginning you know what we see when we're young impressionable trainees to coming out the other end you know what would you say to a young surgeon today makes a good surgeon well i think a a, a good surgeon first of all has to have compassion uh you you need to understand what it means to sit in front of a person or a family and tell them first of all a diagnosis and then what you're going to do about it. I I think I went into surgery because I liked the reinforcement of surgery. Uh, I enjoyed being in the operating room, but I I really loved the sort of the diagnostic uh, opportunities I had as a surgeon. So I think a surgeon and you know you've heard this term that a surgeon is really an internist who likes to operate. And, and I, I think a, a, a surgeon needs to understand the importance of diagnosis and a surgeon needs to communicate. That's why I think communication 
being able to sit in front of a, a family, keeping them informed uh, is so important. And when I had the opportunity to be chair of surgery and director of a surgical residency program, uh, this is something that I, I really pushed. And I, I think it's, uh, you know, the art of medicine, the art of surgery. These are the things we talk about. I mean, obviously, you have to have some skill with your hands. You have to command a presence in the operating room. Uh, you have to be kind to people. You have to be willing to uh, understand that everybody is your team. And, uh, and that is everybody from the person pushing the broom in the hospital to uh, the, uh, the highest person uh, that you work with. So I, I tried to push that with young uh, surgeons. Have humility. Always have humility. Uh, feel humble. Feel grateful uh, about what you're, what you're doing and the opportunities that you were given. Yeah, and I think there's, uh, I mean, those are good and fine words to live by. Um, have you, um, how do I phrase this? Um, was that always your spin on life um, or were you a different person as a 35 year old? You know, I, I don't think I've changed very much over the years. I really don't. Um, I mean, obviously we all have our foibles. Uh, you know, I smoked at one time uh, and, uh, you know, uh, probably I didn't uh, appreciate uh, uh, studying as much as I should, but I, I think you know, as far as my, my desire to, uh, to communicate with people, to be compassionate. And now what I really enjoy is the opportunity of mentoring. Uh, I've always enjoyed being a mentor. I've always enjoyed being able to open up uh, a door for someone. And uh, it gives me a lot of pleasure. Um, I wrote an, an editorial recently for my uh, 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 general dreams editorials about Freud and Freud. Freud and Freud, a German term mean, meaning that you feel good when somebody else does something good, uh, rather than Schadenfreude, which is you 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 feel that uh, people always often feel that uh, if somebody gets ahead or does something, uh, it's it's not good for you. That's not what you should feel. Yeah. You should feel good about doing something for somebody else. It's the uh, opposite to the late Gore Vidal's phrase, you know, every time a friend of mine succeeds, a little something inside me dies. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And so I, I, I've, I've, I've sort of felt this way. And, uh, you know, again, I don't have the direct contact uh, with residents the way I used to. I, I still work with residents and students episodically, but uh, those are the messages I tried to pass. Now, the word communication you've uh, used there several times, and um, you are an unusual surgeon in that um, you've had what, what I would refer to as a, a media profile since your teens, I think. Um, um, you know, with uh, being on radio, if you like, and you were have certainly been a pioneer in the world of podcasts and one thing or another. Um, has that just been something that you've enjoyed as a communicator, or or how did that uh, come about? Tell us that story. Well, I you know, as as a kid, I I liked sports too, and I uh, music was always big for me. I started playing clarinet when I was about six years old, and then developed into all of the woodwind instruments. Uh, played in bands in high school. I had a rock and roll band in high school. When I was fourteen, I had a radio show uh, in the uh, town where I lived. It was a show to really highlight what was going on at my high school. And I really enjoyed that. So when I got to college, uh, I had a, a show in the uh, University of Virginia radio uh, for a number of years, uh, which I really enjoyed. Um, and, uh, you know, it was it, it was it was something that gave me pleasure because uh, music, again, fit into that. Uh, I started uh, the pep band at University of Virginia, uh, which has um, was a, a pleasure. We used to play at football games, basketball games. So, you know, music, communication. I got involved in oratorical contests when I was young. 
uh, and uh, learn the art of public speaking. And as I, I, I've told others, I mean, I, I think, you know, uh, speaking is, is something that you, you learn, you, you mm. hone into an art form. I don't think people are born uh, speakers. I used to get nervous, uh, as anybody would, in front of uh, uh, an audience. Um, and, uh, you know, I think the little butterflies are good. Sure. But then, you know, as I, as I got older and you, you talked about other things, I, I always like to do some other things. And I, I think, you know, over the years, I've, I've been an MC for uh, organizations that have certain things like uh, SAGES uh and uh M mc for their sing-off yeah uh, it enjoys i enjoy <laughs> doing things like that i'll be doing it again in a couple of weeks uh and so uh you know over the years i i was an english major i was one of the uh, one of two liberal arts majors in my medical school class so not only is uh the the oral communication is important but writing is important yeah. Uh, and I think that's a lost art uh, among many people in medicine today uh, with the EMR and other things that are used. Uh, I tried to push the residents uh, to make sure that, you know, they don't lose those important art forms. Yeah. And that's, as you say, yes, I, I read so many notes today that appear to be written in text format. Um, and I know the residents um, often laugh at me slightly because I, you know, I write about the patient um, and I always point out to them that um, you need to have a relationship with your patient, know about them, who they are, where they come from, you know, what sort of dog they have, that sort of stuff, because, you know, if it, it should it come to the moment where you have to tell them something really bad, you, you know, it's just better to have a relationship with them. So they, they trust you and they know you and, and uh, they also have a relationship with you. And you can't do that just by ticking a box and filling in a form. You have to sit and talk to them about, about nonsense, you know. Uh, well, I used to work with residents, for instance, how to do a, a, an operative uh, yeah. dictation. You know, this is not something, some, some people think that uh, a young surgeon is born with the opportunity and the knowledge to do this. And, and what bothers me so much now is that there are many uh, in academic centers, there are many attendings who don't even allow a resident to dictate. And of course, now we're getting into templative yeah. operative notes, which is even worse. Uh, I have to, I support it because of certain organizations that I am currently working with, but it's a, it's a lost art form. Yeah, it is. And often after two pages you were left wondering what exactly happened and what was done um etc so you've um i mean you've been extraordinarily successful in the cancer world with um, um pages of accolades and enormous contributions commission on cancer etc cetera, etc cetera. um and uh, you know hats off kudos to all of that um what was your skill um, what were you good at that that allowed you succeed? Well, I think I'm I'm pretty skillful on uh, on running a meeting. Uh, you know, again, I, I I think that that that's an art form in itself. Uh, when you get involved in organizations, I I I got involved early on uh, when I got back into academics from being in a private practice setting. Uh, and wanted to be involved in organizations. I wanted to be involved in the American College of Surgeons. I wanted to be involved in certain other organizations, and I was lucky there were some doors open for me. I was in the right place at the right time, but as I, as I went up in these organizations uh, and served on committees and things, uh, there's a certain skill in how to run a meeting and how to make sure that everybody is uh, brought into the discussion uh, and everybody feels like they're a part of the activity, but keeping things going. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, that's even been more important as we have the pandemic and we have Zoom calls uh, because that's a skill in itself to run a, a yeah. Zoom meeting. But so I think that's one of the things that really has helped me. Uh, where, where does ego come into the success of 
people like you or or many other surgeons that we both know, et cetera. Um, it, you know, is is it necessary? Is it a good thing? Is it an evil? Uh, you know, what, what do you think about ego? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I, I think everybody has ego. I think certainly surgeons are known for their ego. It has to be kept in check. Uh, I, I think for me, uh, early on, one of the things that that affected me as uh, as a young surgeon is I would I would go to the American College of Surgeons, and I would sit in the audience and listen to uh, the 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 real leaders talk, and I would always watch people going up after they talk and said hello to each other and I always felt as an outsider and I said you know I'd I'd really like to be part of that one day I'd like to be part of that activity and not as an outsider so you know again self-promotion uh is okay and uh I've probably tried to promote what I do uh not in a bad way but uh certainly uh to let people know what's going on in my program. One of the things that I, I started when I became chair, for instance, I was, I was chair at an academic program, but not a university program. And so it was a very good community hospital, but nobody really knew what Carolina's Medical Center was all about. So every month, I invited a leading surgeon to come in and give grand rounds. And it was remarkable because when you start having people come in who are known in the world of surgery, but they see what you have, they go out and proselytize for you. Yes. Yeah. And uh, this was wonderful. And it, it's still today. I have people coming up to me today uh, who were with me 20 years, 25 years ago, who was invited uh, and uh, said, you know, I loved the time that you picked me up at the airport. Nobody has ever picked me up who's a chair before. Yeah. And I, I, I still remember that. And so thank you for inviting me. So, you know, that in a, in a way was, was my, it satisfied my need to know who these leaders were, but also to promote my program. I, uh, I recall many years ago going to Munich um, as the guest of uh, Rudy Siebert, um, and um, who was a very um, uh, classic Bavarian type um, surgeon. And I was picked up at the airport by one of his residents in a seven series BMW, uh, which I, I thought was kind of unusual for a young resident. And um, we drove down the Autobahn at um, a rate of knots that uh, um, I was quite alarming, um, et cetera. And, I eventually um, plucked up the courage to inquire from this young man, you know, who, who was he and how did he have uh, such a lovely car, you know? And he told me that uh, he was uh, Professor Sievert's uh, resident. And luckily, Professor Sievert was a very close friend of, with the family who owned BMW, who had provided this car for the day. And so he had determined that regardless of who was in the car with him, he was going to check this car out. <laughs> so it was a, a near death experience as the resident got to take the seven series BMW for a That's blast a great, down the auto. <laughs> great story. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. So uh, I mentioned earlier on that you um, have become um, known for many things, of course, uh, as we discussed earlier, but, um, this strange uh, uh, profession you have or hobby that you have, which is more than a hobby of, um, of being such a pioneer in podcasts. Um, again, tell me how that started and, and what have you, what's it, what have you learned from it? What have you, what do you understand about um, podcasts now? Well, I, I think, podcasting is an interesting medium that's, you know, I mean, there, there are millions of these podcasts, as, as you know. I, I first got involved, um, I used to listen to NPR, that was one of my favorite uh, stations to listen to here in Charlotte. So, um, oh, about uh, 15 or 16 years ago, 
I had an opportunity. We had the American College of Surgeons meeting in Washington. And uh, I had a good friend who's a surgeon, David Rines, who's a uh, trauma surgeon who I've known for years. And he's, he's married to Nina Totenberg. Uh, and Nina is uh, a, a, uh, the person on NPR who talks about the Supreme Court. So I, I had a chance to go and they took me around and I, I talked to them about having a show on NPR at that time when I was at the studio. And uh, several people became interested. What I wanted to do was have a medical talk show uh, that people could call into. Uh, I thought that would be interesting. And my, uh, the group that I loved listening to was Car Talk. Uh, Car Talk was recorded in, in the NPR station in Boston. So uh, some years later, uh, it was obvious that I couldn't get to Washington to do a show, but I was doing a, a show out of Durham, North Carolina, with a group that did sort of a pharmacy type show. And I, they, were, they were allowing me to sort of have little bits and pieces on that. But I said, well, I, I wanna start my own show. So Davidson College is a wonderful liberal arts college just north of Charlotte. So uh, WDAV is actually the NPR station for, for the classical music of NPR. They do all of their, their producing there. So the, uh, they had a new producer, a new, uh, person came to direct that uh, that WDAV, and he had been the producer of Car Talk. So I went to talk to him one day, and several of my faculty were Davidson graduates. So I said, you know, I'd like to have a show like Car Talk that I could do. It's a live show. He said, well, you know, Car Talk was never live. You think it's live when you listen on Saturday. I said, what do you mean? I said, it's, it's a call-in show. Oh, no, that show was produced on Tuesday. It's a call-out show. When you call the 800 number on Saturday, some operator listened to your story. If they thought you were interesting, they called you back on Tuesday and recorded it. That's why they knew everything about the cars. And so I said, well, that's interesting. He said, but we'll, we'll give you a shot. So anyway, they hired a producer and I had a show on NPR that was syndicated on NPR called The Recovery Room. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I got to interview a lot of interesting people. It was about medical things. Um, when Obamacare came in, we did several shows on that. Uh, I got to interview people about medical tourism, about all sorts of interesting yeah. things. But, you know, it was taking its toll. I, it's 20 miles up the road, and I would have to leave on Tuesday afternoon every week to do the show, no matter what was going on in my life. Uh, because we had planned to have these people and, you know, several people I had in the studio, but most of the people were by phone, yeah. very good quality phones, because we didn't have Zoom really uh, yeah. to deal with at that time. It was all audio. So I did that for 12 years. And then uh, after that, I, uh, uh, people started coming to me. And so the American College of Surgeons came. They wanted to start a podcast for surgical readings uh, in general surgery. Uh, I've, uh, the Society of Surgical Oncology, uh, uh, I'm associate editor. So I, I spun the idea, well, maybe we ought to do, uh, some interviews, uh, for authors who publish in SSO uh, related journals. So that worked out. I'm doing that podcast. And then I started a new podcast about a year ago for something I really enjoy. And that is working with cancer registries and cancer registrars to show the benefit of what they do, because that's a, that's a, that's a group that nobody really knows much about. So uh, those yeah. are the current, uh, those are the current podcasts that I do. It keeps me fairly, fairly busy, um, but uh, I really enjoy it. it. It's, it has struck me that to some extent, um, podcasts are the, the, the spoken version, as opposed to the YouTube, um, where there is a, you know, a visual but the spoken version is a bit like radio shows where you don't have your own radio show. You just decide I'm going to do it anyway. Is, do you think it's, in other words, it's allowed people who could not get their own radio show on NPR, if you like, um, in your case, um, say, well, I don't care what NPR thinks. I'm doing my own radio show, except I'm calling it a podcast. Is, is that a fair description? Well, I, I think so. Now, now in, in my situation, uh, I felt that, in, you know, I, I think things should be done professionally. And I listen to a lot of podcasts 
that are not particularly uh, professional. So I, um, I do these podcasts with a professional producer, uh, with music that's brought into the podcast, uh, and things like that. I keep them fairly short. I have my, I, I keep podcasts 20, 25 minutes at most, uh, for people. Uh, and, um, you know, and I, I obviously decide who I'm going to interview. Uh, it's opened up a lot of opportunities for me to bring people in. Uh, I think people generally want to get, uh, their message across, especially people who write uh, articles for journals. Yeah. Uh, and that's, a that's a nice thing, especially for residents and, and young and young faculty members. And so, uh, for you sure. know, yeah. uh, I, I always make sure that they know what I'm going to ask them. I think somebody who gets sandbagged during a podcast, especially about information that uh, is fairly technical, that's not fair to them. So I, I always lay out a program for these people. You know, it's interesting. You, you say, you know, people always like to know, you always let them know what you're going to ask them. I, I was interviewed on stage in Australia maybe 15 years ago and at a Congress and the surgeon interviewing me um, blindsided me by asking, he'd found within my CV um, or on, on, uh, on PubMed, a letter that was written from a bunch of academics in the UK. And at that time I was a department chairman and it was about working time restrictions and called something, the title of the letter in the journal, which I had never seen the, the title that the journal had given to it, sleeping through the night or something like that. And he said, tell me about this paper you wrote called Sleeping Through the Night. And I literally had no idea what he was talking about. It was mortifyingly embarrassing. And even after um, the, uh, the conversation, I, it took me like a day and a half to find out what it was. And then I suddenly realized, it's not a paper, it's a letter that <laughs> was written by, signed by, I think about 60 chairman department chairs that the, the journal had called sleeping through the night or something. So as you say, it was, um, you know, it would have been nice to have been told because actually it was a very topical subject at that time. And I could have spoken to it as opposed to being humiliated in front well, of hundreds. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, and, and this goes not only for, for hosting podcasts, it's for moderating a program. It's yeah. for anything that one exactly. does. I mean, you yeah. don't want to embarrass people. And we've all seen people embarrassed at meetings, uh, especially during discussion of a paper. And uh, I, I like to make people feel comfortable. I, one of the things I've seen, even with these Zoom podcasts, I can tell when somebody's particularly nervous. And one of the real joys is to calm down a person. Um, one of the uh, wonderful opportunities I had uh, you may remember in the beginning of laparoscopy, uh, Ethicon opened its wonderful uh, lab in Cincinnati. And they asked me to be the MC of a worldwide teleconference, honoring their new opening of this, uh, yeah. this wonderful place in Cincinnati. And so uh, they invited all of these surgeons, notable people who were doing a lot of interesting things already in laparoscopy. And this was a live show. I mean, these were, this was like a stage. This was at the, the TV station in Cincinnati. And one of the surgeons who I interviewed, he came on, the sweat was pouring. I thought the poor guy was absolutely going to collapse in front of me. And I just took it upon myself. I said, we have to make sure that he gets through this. And, you know, just trying to calm people down. Of course, that's, none of these podcasts are live. And I always tell people that your comments can be edited. We do yes. these, we edit things that if you say something and you want to change, our producer can change for you. So, you know, I think that's another thing that, that you try to do. You try to relax people. Yeah. And as you say, in the early days of laparoscopy, all sorts of things went out live that, um, with the benefit of mature reflection was perhaps not wise. I, I vividly remember in the mid nineties being stuck in an operating room with a microphone in my hand um, 
uh, narrating what was going on in the OR. Um, and um, back to a hall where 500 people were sitting watching this live feed. Um, and the, the surgeon in question was doing a, 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 a left colectomy, which was quite, <laughs> quite clearly beyond his skill set at this time. And so very little was, uh, and this was in Birmingham in England, um, so not that far from Birmingham um, was um, is uh, the uh, Test cricket ground called Edgebaston, and I remember this was the very early days of cell phones. And I said to the cameraman who had the tripod and the whole thing, you know, I said, "Do you have a cell phone?" And he went, "Yeah." I said, "Could you see if you can find out from your buddy what the score at the Test match is?" <laughs> and, uh, they came back from the hall saying, and so what is the latest development in this operation? And the answer to that was, you know, precisely nothing had happened. And I said, well, there hasn't been much progress in the, um, in the, in the operation, but I can tell you England has lost two wickets in the last 30 minutes. <laughs> and the, at this point, you know, the surgeon was like dripping in sweat because he was totally stressed out and, I, I, it's never ceased to amaze me, surgeons who agree to do live operating. I never do live operating, but agree to do it. And then when somebody says to them, so what are you doing there? They go, I'm sorry, I can't talk now. And you go, what's the purpose of you doing this? You know, it's not for everyone. Um, you know, I, I've never had a problem talking when I'm operating. I just don't like doing it because I'm not sure if I was a patient, I would want to be operated on by, you know, in that setting. That's just my view, et cetera. So. Absolutely. No, that's um, a good point. Good point. So um, in your surgical career, there have been many changes um, uh, from the, surg the surg surgery you started in uh, PGY2345 to the surgery that you left, as you said, nine years ago, what would you say um, have been the biggest changes that you've seen for good and for bad? Well, of course, uh, you know, one of the major changes since I started in the early 70s was how we approach uh, certain diseases. I mean, again, I mentioned a radical mastectomy. I, I only did radical mastectomies as a uh, as a young resident, uh, that's what we did. And to see the change, uh, and, and luckily the change was occurring as I finished and I got into practice and I, I learned, you know, uh, a little less mutilating procedures uh, for women with breast cancer. And of course, uh, as technology came uh, and uh, you've been involved in the, the laparoscopic uh, approaches and now robotics, um, I, I felt in my practice and I was doing laparoscopy. I, it was something I had to learn really after. Now, luckily, I, I did some laparoscopy as a resident because we were, we were using it to stage patients uh, with, uh, with uh, abdominal malignancy. Yeah. And so that's really how I got into organizational work that I did, especially my staging work, um, is I presented early on to the American Joint Committee on Cancer, who does the TNM staging in, in the United States, and also to the UICC uh, later on, that you could use the laparoscope for staging yeah. different cancers. So that's how that opened up for me. But I knew I was never going to get into robotics at the last part of my training, because I was never going to use that. I found it fascinating. Yeah. Um, I, I never have really felt comfortable with a surgeon being remote from the mm -hmm. patient. That's not something that I really enjoy seeing. It was hard enough for me to teach at the operating table, a young surgeon to do a laparoscopic procedure. I knew my hands could work quickly if I needed to. I yeah. knew I was there scrubbed. I could open if I needed to. But this idea of sitting at a console and uh, away from the patient with multiple tubes going into a patient abdomen, uh, it's, it's always been a little foreign to me. Now, I know people relish it. Uh, you can't go to a meeting today without hearing about some bizarre operation done with a robot. Uh, and uh, I, th I think that's good and bad. I think the idea of getting patients out of the hospital is good. Uh, you know, ERS, 
uh, early recovery after surgery and uh, all of those good things we're doing, avoiding tubes when you can. And they're all good things. And I think one of the things that was hard for me is you, you have to give up things that you were taught were important. Uh, NG tubes, Foley catheters, uh, drains left in for seven days and tweaked. Uh, you know, these, these are things that you have to give up on. And it's, it's hard sometimes uh, to give up on these things. Um, and, yeah. uh, you know, uh, as an old proverb, it says, knowledge is learning something new every day. Wisdom is giving up something every day. And so, uh, you know, it takes, it takes a little of both. Yeah, and I, I was commenting to some residents today that, you know, it just so happens that, you know, I came into, I started my surgical career, what I consider in retrospect was at the end of the era where we had no idea what we were doing, because we didn't have ultrasound, CT, MRI, readily available endoscopy, nuclear medicine. And so this made it very difficult. Um, and you just operated on people, um, whereas, and plus the fact that we, we frequently didn't alter the outcome of diseases. Um, you know, in, in that same time frame, we've had dramatic changes in the effectiveness of chemotherapy and, you know, diseases have disappeared. Um, and now we are much more knowledgeable about what it is that we're trying to achieve with and whole diseases have changed in their outcomes. I mean, I, 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 it's it's hard for me to believe that we actually took women to the operating room and not knowing whether they had breast cancer or not, and then coming out and happily telling somebody, oh, it's just a benign adenoma, or then telling people, uh, you know, we had to do a mastectomy. I, I mean, it's that is is so bizarre to me that we actually lived through that era. Yeah, and you know now we live through the era where you know people come out and say you know the definition of of success in rectal cancer has been for so many years the patient surviving the operation, um, you know at some technical expertise a low anterior section right down low and et cetera et cetera and the fact that you then cruise up to the patient and say great news there was no cancer there. Um, you know, 20 years ago, the patients would say, oh, that's fantastic. But legitimately now the patients are saying, wait, what? What, 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 what do we do that for then? You know, surgeons, one of the things I always include in my lectures is that surgeons are extremely facile at recommending the removal of other people's rectums. Exactly. I mean, I, 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 I think the, the era of watch and wait uh, for rectal cancer is 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 really interesting. I mean, I, I think we all lived through uh, the nigro technique for anal cancer. Of course, that was something that uh, was was really revolutionary. And and now to think of you know um, upwards of maybe 40, 50, 60 percent of patients can be spared who have good neoadjuvant treatment for rectal cancer. I mean, that's you know those are the things. And and, and people always say, well, aren't you worried that there won't be anything to operate on? And I said, no. I don't think that that's going to be for future surgeons a problem. I think that uh, there will be opportunities uh, to still do surgery. I said, you know, it's great if you don't have to do a mutilating operation. Yeah, no, for sure. Uh, for sure. So uh, in this interview or discussion, of course, I'm breaching your own podcast rule of being uh, short, you know, 20 minutes, et cetera, et cetera. Because, of course, um, you know, it's a it's a slightly different nature of conversation. Um, you know, a little more. It's not simple. You're not simply here to promote your latest book or your uh, movie or your article, etc. Um, so we get, we get to talk a, a little more uh, esoterically about some aspects of things. So, and without being, I, I do ask this of of lots of people, Rick. So don't don't feel don't feel victimized, but. How would you like to be remembered? And how do you think you will be remembered? I really, I really would like to be remembered for um, someone who uh, helped promote organizations uh, that were helpful to uh, not only people in the organization, but to uh, uh, 
people outside the organization. I would like to be remembered uh, as someone who opened doors for others uh, and uh, made it easier uh, to have access to things that they may not have had access to. Uh, I would like to think that I served as a role model and mentor for uh, some young surgeons who I had a chance to uh, work with and teach. And I, I tell you, John, the, the, um, one of the things I still love and I still have an opportunity to, to have is when a uh, person that was in practice uh, in, 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 in my residencies that I dealt with uh, calls me and asks my opinion on how to manage a patient and lets me know uh, that, uh, that they might have learned something from me that helped yeah. uh, in their management. That, that really makes my day. And, uh, you know, that, that kind of thing. So, you know, I, I think a legacy uh, of kindness, uh, a, a legacy to know that uh, not only did you, you work well with, with the doctors, uh, but you, you also helped others. And, and in my role today at my cancer center as a, as a medical director, I'm able to really promote people in a variety of areas, nurse navigators, cancer registrars. I try to open up doors for them uh, to have a, a, a peer reviewed paper in a journal uh, to get them uh, promoted in some way. And so that makes me feel good. And do you think that's how you will be remembered? Because um, your description of the number of things that you might be remembered for you'd like to be, of course, is something that somebody who knows you very well and closely would recognize. Um, but do you, how do you think you will be remembered? Is it the same answer or different? Well, it, some people you know, say differently. You know? Yeah, I mean, let's face it. I mean, people who don't know me won't remember me at all. And so uh, I appreciate that. Uh, you know, I've, I've often, I, you know, mentioned that from, from my... Uh, my headstone, my eulogy, you know, he reached the final stage, uh, you know, and it's, it's a, it's sort of a, a pun to my, <laughs> to my staging work. You know, I, I really feel that what I've contributed uh, in, in 25, 26 years now of being the editor of this TNM system and how we stage patients. Um, I think that's, that's something that's, that's important. I, I will leave. Uh, for others. And, and when people hear, oh, you really, you, you're the editor of the TNM staging manual. And, you know, uh, it's, they, they sort of even, even know, um, and I've, I've even met veterinarians who take care of, of cancer in animals who say, you, you edit the TNM system. I said, yes. Do you know it? He says, yes, we use it in veterinary medicine. And I said, oh, that's interesting. I never knew that. And so, you know, I guess, I guess those are those are the way people might might remember you. I, I'm uh, not sure that that's the right eulogy to say he reached the final stage. I, I would personally say it should be he wrote the final stage. <laughs> Perhaps I might I might use that. You know, uh, it, it's it's sort of interesting. Um, you know, despite things that I've done medically and scientifically in my articles. Like some organizations, and I'll use sages again, they remember me only for being the MC of the singer. Yeah, exactly. You're right. I mean, that's the, my only contribution <laughs> yeah, to that exactly. entire organization. Yeah, and it's the famous, um, you know, how would you like to be remembered? Uh, a friend of mine once answered that by saying, I just would. <laughs> <laughs> um, which I think is the point you make, you know, unless it's your students or your patients, most people won't remember you. Um, and... I always thought it was a great tragedy that the late John Gallagher had it built into his contract with Ballier Tyndall that his book died with him. Um, he would not allow it be re-edited. And, yeah. um, and, you know, one of the consequences of that is that there's a whole generation of surgeons now who have never heard of John Gallagher. You know, um, it's, it, it is amazing and how surgical history is, is a lost art. I, I had the opportunity to work with... Uh, with John Gallagher in Leeds uh, during that year that I spent in London. And I, I'll never forget, he, he had about 10 different operations one day and, you know, I mean, uh, APR and followed by a low anterior, whatever. And after the third or fourth operation, 
he said, uh, come on in, let's sit down for a while. I said, okay. And we sat down in, a, in his lounge there. And all of a sudden, somebody opens the door and comes in with this silver tea service. And we, we had tea. And I said, this is, I thought to myself, this is absolutely bizarre. I mean, here's a guy who's, he's got all of these cases and we're sitting there having tea. I said, this would never work <laughs> in, in where I'm from. And so, you know, again, and, and some of those experiences with, uh, you know, the surgeons I work with there and their, and their uh, you know, their practices outside of St. Mark's, uh, it, but, but you're right. I mentioned these people and uh, uh, had no idea who Lynn Lockhart Mummery is, uh, who Peter Hawley is, and John Gallagher. And, you know, and, and I try to tell them, you know, I think this is, this is important for you to learn who these giants were. Exactly. Um, I, I'm going to uh, uh, finish by asking you, um, you, you said you stopped operating nine years ago. Um, uh, just talk me through briefly how you came to that decision at that time. It's a, it's a challenge for many surgeons. Sure. Yeah. And I, I, I didn't stop because I, I felt I couldn't operate. I, I, I felt I was still, uh, you know, at the height of my game. I, uh, I was, uh, I was busy in the operating room. Uh, I became busier doing administrative things. Um, I really stopped because I had stopped taking call uh, a couple of years before that. And, uh, you know, it, it sort of made me feel a little, because I was still moderating M&M meetings, that, you know, I, I wasn't in the fray. I, I did trauma surgery for years, yeah. but I wasn't really in the fray anymore. And as I became busier administratively, of course, it pulls you away more from the operating room. And I had an opportunity to open up this cancer institute here in Charlotte and was invited to participate administratively in that. And I, I just thought, you know, um, I found that when I was going on vacation uh, with my wife and getting away, I really never was relaxing. I was always worried about my patients and I'm sure you felt the same way and feel the same way. And uh, I just said, Hmm, it made me feel so good about not taking call. How would it feel if I wasn't worrying about somebody every day? Yeah. yeah. And I tell you, it was such a revelation to me to finally step down. Now I will tell you that I still dream about being in the operating room sometime and I do miss patient care. Yeah, I sure. miss patient care more than I miss the operating room. Now, I do have people calling me all the time and asking me for my thoughts and, you know, around who I who I know, but it's not the same. But yeah, uh, it was not, you know, that last day that I knew I was going to do a case. Um, it wasn't the end of the world for me. Uh, and I walked away not knowing that there wasn't somebody making me walk away. Sure. Uh, you know, I was 68 years old, uh, 69 years old uh, when I walked away. And, um, you know, I, I thought I had spent a number of years doing what I did. And you had something to walk away to, which I think is yes. a deficiency with some yeah. surgeons. You and, know? and, you know, people always ask, oh, uh, are you retired? I said, no, that's the word not in my lexicon. Yeah. I said, I, I, I think the R words, you reinvent and you want to feel relevant. As long as I'm reinventing myself and feeling relevant, that's what I think people should do. Yeah, and I think relevant is... Uh... Relevant is an individual's definition, as in relevant for person A is different to relevant to person B. I mean, some people define their relevance by their professional relevance, whereas others, I was talking to a surgeon who gave up work a, a year ago uh, for this podcast, and he, he is not uh, working uh, clinically. Um, and is delighted to go to art museums and the opera um, something he always wanted to do and has never been able to do. And as, as he said, he, he doesn't miss it in the way that he thought he might um, because he's, he has these other interests, um, which I think is, is interesting. So 
Um, our final thing is extremely cheesy, and I'm uh, haunted by your phrase of uh, unprofessional podcasts, um, which I'm sure will um, you when when this comes out, you will send a detailed and lengthy critique. Uh, <laughs> but in the meantime, this is the um, the uh, seven or eight quick questions which you see in magazines and and uh, in the TV shows and one thing or another. Um, um, I uh, There are no correct answers to these quick questions. You have no time to think of the answers, but recognize that I personally do know the correct answers to all of them. So you I'm sure. Me. Yes. So are you ready to go? Absolutely. Hit me. Okay. Baseball or football? Baseball, baseball. or football? Baseball. Yeah. Uh, Coke or Pepsi? Coke. M uh, Mac or PC? Mac. Uh, cats or dogs? Dogs. Uh, Burger King or McDonald's? Burger King. Beatles or Stones? Stones. Home or away? Home. Here we go. Rick, it's been a distinct pleasure um, to see you again and to, I have to say, I'm, I'm also suffering from equipment envy with this enormous, uh, it's, I'm not really sure how to describe this um, extremely threatening microphone that you have in front of your head. Um, it's very, very impressive. Uh, your implement well, John, is I... much bigger than mine. <laughs> Well, I, I appreciate that mine's bigger than yours, but I, I will tell you that it was my 11-year-old grandson designed this and helped me purchase this equipment. So he told me what to get. It is deeply worrying. And <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you, I'm glad you uh, had the uh, technical advice from the right source. <laughs> John, I, I really appreciate the opportunity of doing this. And I, I really appreciate the opportunity of seeing you and, and listening to you. And likewise, Rick, it's a, a pleasure. Uh, I'll let you know when we are going live, okay? All right, my friend.